Okay, so welcome again, everyone, to our Andrews University Chemistry Department, Chemistry and Biochemistry Department uh, seminar series. Um, today we have another very special speaker, and that speaker will be introduced to you by Shehun Kim. Um, before she does, um, Shehun is a sophomore here at Andrews in the chemistry biochemistry department, majoring in biochemistry. She was born and grew up in South Korea, but did high school here in our local area in uh, St. Joe at the St. Sinjo, Joseph High School. And one of her pastimes, one of her hobbies is playing tennis. What kind of tennis? Table tennis or like outdoor tennis? Oh, the outdoor tennis. Okay. All right. Okay. So you can take it away. Okay. Um, Professor Nick Glenos got his bachelor's degree in plant science from Cornell University in 2018. He's a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor in the Department of Molecular Integrative Physiology. Currently under the supervision of Dr. Michael Wong and Jimo Borjigan, he is leading a project to investigate the biological and physiological functions of the endogenous, endogenously produced psychedelic compound NN dimethyltryptamine DMT in the mammalian brain. Today, Professor Niklinos will be presenting about DMT, a monoamine found in a variety of mammals and plants, which when given to humans produces intense but short acting hallucinogen and psychedelic effects. Despite several hypotheses, the physiological role of endogenous DMT in mammals remains unknown. Professor Grinos is utilizing an INMT deficient rat model in the Borjigan lab to better understand the physiological function and significance of endogenous DMT in mammals. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nick Grinos. Thank you very much, Shayun. That was that was great. Um, one correction: um, I'm flattered by the professor title, but um, I'm merely a PhD student uh, in my third year, so I've got a long way off before that. Um, but thank you anyway. Maybe that's uh, some foreshadowing, possibly. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen here, and we can get started here. So um, the title of my talk here is, um, well, Desmond suggested a great title and he said DMT is the spirit molecule and I, I love that title. Um, um, and it's a really interesting question, but uh, what I'm gonna talk about here is um, endogenous DMT and we're gonna ask the questions, what do we know and where are we going? And um, I suppose I should do my full screen here. How's that? Okay, so just a quick introduction uh, about myself, um, even though Shay Hyun just gave a, a great one. Um, I did my undergraduate work. Um, I actually started at a community college in Montana at Flathead Valley Community College. Um, and I got interested in biology and botany. And from there I transferred to Cornell University in New York, in Ithaca, New York. And that's where I got uh, a botany degree, uh, a bachelor's degree there. And then um, around that time I was getting interested in the sort of in the rising research in, in psychedelics. Um, people were doing um, studies of magic mushrooms and LSD with, with psychedelics and they were uh, starting, to, starting to come out publicly and I wanted to get involved in that in some way. So I actually contacted um, this medical doctor named Dr. Rick Strassman who wrote the book called DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And I said, how can I get involved in this? And Rick Strassman connected me with uh, Dr. Jimo Borjigan who's pictured here and uh, that was the history and I ended up joining Jima's lab and now I'm a, a third year PhD student in, in her lab and I'm studying the, the physiological roles of endogenously produced DMT. And endogenous, if you're not familiar, it means that it's naturally produced in the body. I'll be using that word pretty often throughout this. So <clears throat> here's just an outline of what we'll talk about today, what I'll go through. Um, I'll start off with a definition and a brief history of DMT and then go into some of the research and talk about um, what's been studied over the last several decades. And then I'll explain our approach to studying endogenous DMT in the Borjigan lab. And then I'll be able to provide some preliminary data from our work. So to start off, um, a definition and brief history of DMT. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a really simple, small, low molecular weight indolamine that looks like this. It's got an indole group here, um, a tertiary amine, it's uh, a methylated amine, and it's uh, a really simple compound that's actually pretty similar to some other endogenous compounds in our body. And it's also widely uh, found in nature. There's hundreds of species of plants that contain DMT and uh, a number of different mammals as well, including humans. And it's not to say that other animals don't produce it. It's just that we haven't tested, tested a lot of mammals. So it's, it's almost ubiquitous is, is what a lot of people are saying. It's widespread in nature. Um, and the interesting thing is when you give DMT to people, it's a really potent, powerful psychedelic drug. So this is what the compound looks uh, crystallized and users often um, smoke it, vaporize it and smoke it, or it's uh, injected intravenously. And it produces these really potent short acting um, hallucinatory um, psychedelic experiences associated, associated with disembodiment and um, really profound spiritual uh, experiences. And this fact is, I think, what caused Dr. Strassman to coin this molecule, the spirit molecule. It reliably in, in, induces a sort of spiritual experience in, in people who, who use it. And to understand about endogenous DMT, I think it's important to look at the, the basic biochemistry of how DMT is synthesized in the brain and in the body. And DMT actually starts with the dietary amino acid tryptophan. And tryptophan is widely available in a number of foods we eat, so we get it, get a pretty regular supply of it. And um, through a two-step or three-step methyl um, enzymatic process, DMT or DMT is produced from, from tryptophan. And that requires two essential enzymes. The first enzyme here is amino acid decarboxylase. And that enzyme decarboxylases um, uh, the, the carboxyl group from, from tryptophan to produce tryptamine. Um, and then the next enzyme is INMT. So it's endolethylamine N-methyltransferase. And that methylates the um, amine group of tryptamine to produce dimethyltryptamine. So it's a two-step process there of INMT. And like I said before, DMT is actually really uh, structurally similar to the common neurotransmitter serotonin. Um, if you look at the structure of DMT, it's really similar to the structure of serotonin. Uh, serotonin has a hydroxyl group here and is, is not methylated on the, on the amino group. And also the, the biosynthetic pathways of DMT and serotonin are also similar. Serotonin also relies on the enzymatic activity of AADC. Um, so you could expect that these molecules may have uh, similar uh, pharmacologic properties inside the body because of their structure and because of their um, similarities of uh, biosynthetic pathways. And also their, their metabolism is similar too. Serotonin, DMT, and a number of other endogenous monoamines are rapidly metabolized by enzymes called monoamine oxidases. Um, and um, those, enzymes, those enzymes rapidly metabolize DMT, serotonin, and other compounds to produce, uh, to produce secondary metabolites. And DMT has actually been known about and used for several thousand years uh, throughout uh, Amazonia and South America. So uh, these cultures, indigenous cultures and indigenous tribes have produced what's called um, ayahuasca, which is a, a brew or a concoction or a combination of multiple uh, plants that are, that are brewed, uh, steeped and prepared and then drank and ceremonial, uh, ceremonial situations. And it's uh, really I, the use of ayahuasca is closely related to um, you know healing practices and uh, shamanic healing practices, uh, connection with the the plant world or animal world, connection with um, ancestral people or deceased spirits, so to say. Um, so there's a a widespread use of ayahuasca across Amazonia, and it's a really interesting combination uh, and a sort of a feat of biochemistry that these indigenous people were able to discover and produce this, this tea or this brew. So it's generally a combination of two different plant species. The, the leaves shown here are from the plant Psychotria viridis and the, the bark on the bottom comes from a plant called Banisteriopsis capai. And the Psychotria is the plant that actually contains the DMT. It's got uh, a relatively high concentration of DMT for dry weight. Um, and when you consume DMT, like I mentioned before, we have enzymes in the body called monoamine oxidases, and those enzymes rapidly degrade the DMT. So when you consume DMT orally, it passes through the stomach and the liver, monoamine oxidase breaks it down, and DMT is inactive. Um, but the cool thing about this uh, ayahuasca is that 
the plant Banisteriopsis capai actually contains natural monoamine oxidase inhibitors. One of those is harmine, another one is harmaline. There's, there's a variety of them contained in the plant. And what that does is it blocks the activity of monoamine oxidase such that DMT can become orally active. Um, and this is one of the biggest mysteries of ethnobotany. Um, how do these indigenous people uh, in one of the most diverse, by, uh, botanically diverse regions of the world find out that the combination of these two plants is uh, sufficient and necessary to produce these psychoactive and psychedelic effects. And it's widely used in several cultures across South America. And it's a really important part of uh, culture and history for a lot of these groups. So it's a really interesting thing. So moving on to some of the more uh, modern things about DMT. So we've known about it for quite a while, actually. It was discovered in 1931 by a um, Swiss chemist named Richard Mansky. He discovered DMT in sort of a wave of chemical exploration in the time, and he had no idea about its psych psychoactive or psychedelic properties. And in 1946, there was um, a lot of study of um, ethnography and botany in, in South America, and DMT was first isolated from a, a species of mimosa plant um, in 1946. And the psychedelic effects of DMT weren't discovered until 1956. Uh, a Hungarian chemist named Steven Sara first uh, found out that DMT was psychedelic by administering it to himself. And then he began to do research on giving DMT to humans to find out the effect of, of exogenous DMT. Uh, and this wave sort of initiated uh, interest in linking endogenous DMT to psychiatric disease, uh, mainly schizophrenia. A lot of people saw that the effects of DMT are closely related to some of the effects that you see in schizophrenic patients. And this is uh, you know, visual and audio hallucinations, uh, feeling disconnected or uh, separated from external reality and whatnot. So there was a big surge of research with uh, respect to DMT and, and psychiatric disease. And then in 1970, the Nixon administration uh, with a sweeping swipe of the pen made uh, DMT and several other psychedelic substances and other compounds illegal through the Controlled Substance Act. And this effectively put uh, a, a severe halt to uh, the majority of all psychedelic research that was happening in the, in the United States. And it was a burgeoning field before this happened. So it's um, really kind of a dark time in psychedelic research history. But then in 1994, uh, Dr. Rick Strassman, who I mentioned before, the author of DMT, The Spirit Molecule, uh, published a, a seminal study where he uh, administered DMT to patients and did a, a basic dose response curve study and measured the subjective effects of it. And this sort of kick-started what a lot of people are calling today is the psychedelic renaissance. So it brought psychedelic research back into the mainstream and uh, was sort of a catalyst for, for making that happen. But even though those studies have been conducted and all the we've known about DMT for several decades, in the present time, the functions of DMT, the reasons why we make DMT are pretty much unknown. It's DMT basically exists in a, in a black box of, of, of science at the moment. So moving on to some of the research, uh, what does the research tell us about DMT? Before we go into some of the work of work on endogenous DMT, I think it's really important and interesting to to think about the subjective effects of DMT. What happens when you give DMT to a human? And to, and to do that, we can look at the work of Dr. Rick Strassman. As I mentioned, he was sort of the first person to, to revive psychedelic research after the, after the dark period following the uh, Controlled Substance Act in 1970. And what he did was a basic dose response study of DMT in humans. He gave um, an IV dose of, of DMT to healthy volunteers and uh, what he found was that the effects of DMT begin before the infusion even completes. So this is a really rapidly acting molecule. And the peak effects of the experience happen within two minutes. And then within 30 minutes, the experience is basically over as if, uh, as if nothing had happened. So uh, it's just a, uh, when you relate this to some of the other psychedelics that are being studied like psilocybin and LSD, it's extremely uh, rapid acting and, and it's really quickly metabolized as I mentioned before. And just to sort of give, give an idea of what some of those patients are experiencing, here's a, a quote from, from Strassman's work. And he says, the subjects were almost uniformly overwhelmed at the intensity and speed of onset of this dose given for the first time non-blind. All subjects described an intense, rapidly developing, and usually transiently anxiety-provoking rush throughout their body and mind. This developed before the 45-second infusion was completed. The rush, compared with a freight train by several subjects, immediately and completely disrupted normal mental function, replacing it with hallucinogenic effects. This rush progressed rapidly to a state wherein most subjects lost awareness of their bodies, 
and many were not cognizant of being in a hospital or participating in an experiment for the first minute or two of the experience. So this quote just kind of highlights the really extreme effects of disembodiment where they, the users who are uh, being given DMT completely leave their external reality that, as, as they know it and go into a space that's um, completely unfathomable. And going into some more modern research about the subjective ex experiences of DMT, um, this finding of Dr. Strassman led him to propose that maybe DMT is a spirit molecule. Maybe it's a, a compound that transitions us from, you know, um, from the living to the dying phase. Maybe it has some sort of connection to, to, to dying. Um, and uh, 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 somebody, Chris, Chris Timmerman, who works at uh, Imperial College of London, um, came and did a study to basically test that. And he said, is DMT related to the near-death experience? And he, and he found that, yes, it actually is. So um, what they did was they gave multiple doses of DMT uh, via IV injection to, to humans, and they had them complete a near-death experience questionnaire. And here's a, a subset of some of those questions. And they, they're under categories of cognitive subscale, affective subscale, paranormal subscale, and transcendental subscale. And uh, after the participants had the DMT injection, they did the NDE questionnaire, and they compared that to people who uh, actually had near-death experiences. And these are what the results show. And DMT is in blue here. Near-death experience, actual near-death experience uh, participants or people who had those experiences are in red. And on the left here are all of the um, subscales of the near-death experience questionnaire. And what you see almost uniformly is that there's no statistical difference between people who smoke DMT and people who actually had a near-death experience. Um, one of the categories down here had some significant uh, difference, but most of them uh, didn't at all. And that led him to, led Timmerman and others to hypothesize that uh, DMT experience and the near-death experience are, are uh, potentially similar in, in, in a lot of ways. And the same author, uh, Chris Timmerman and others at Imperial College London, went on to uh, expand on this study and look at what happens in the brain when you give DMT to humans. And uh, in conjunction with that, they measured the subjective effects of the DMT during brainwave analysis. And they did a similar modality here of different doses of uh, IV DMT injection. And they measured EEG, so that's like measuring the brain waves. They took blood samples and they did a, a subjective questionnaire every one minute throughout the experience. And what we see on the bottom here are some of the categories of the subjective experience questionnaire. And some of the things like, I experienced a different reality or dimension, really high in DMT and in almost nothing in placebo. Other things like, uh, things look strange, my sense of time was altered. All of these things are really profound during the DMT experience. And looking at these um, spectrograms over here on the right, we can see that comparing DMT on the top to placebo on the bottom, we see that this line here is tracking the intensity of the subjective, uh, subjective effects. So this is the intensity of these questions on the left here. How intense was the experience via a questionnaire? And the colored part in the bottom is showing the EEG or the brainwave activity of the, of the subject. And we see that there's a, a really strong, profound uh, decrease and basically annihilation of the alpha wave in, uh, in, in the DMT experience. And he also saw uh, an increase in, in theta and delta. And they hypothesized that this mechanism of suppressing alpha and increasing theta and delta is uh, a mechanism to produce the disembodiment and hallucinatory phenomena associated with the DMT experience. Um, so moving on to endogenous DMT, what do we know about it? Um, well, we know that it's been detected in, in mammals and a lot of different bodily fluids and organs. And we can look at some, some old research to show us that. And um, this is just showing a, just a basic table showing humans, rats, and rabbits, and the tissues and the um, um, fluids that DMT has been detected in. And the interesting thing here is that we've known about DMT in the body for several decades. Some of the earliest research here is from the early 70s, and some of the latest research here is from just last year. So we've known about DMT for several decades, yet we still don't have an idea about what its, what its physiological role is. We don't know what it's doing in the body. Um, and one of the difficult things about measuring DMT is that it's present in such low concentrations and it's also metabolized really quickly. 
So looking at um, some of these reports, you, you'll find that DMT concentrations in the, in, in the body, they range from low picomolar to low nanomolar levels. And that's a really, really small amount. So it makes it difficult to, to detect and uh, difficult to study. And that's something I'm presently working and struggling with right now. Um, we also know that DMT binds with high affinity to multiple receptor types. So um, one of the most widely studied receptor in terms of, of psychedelic action is the serotonin 2A receptor or the 5-HT2A receptor. And DMT binds with a variety of ser different serotonin receptors at a relatively low binding affinity. So some of the lowest um, binding affinity for DMT at serotonin receptors is in the, is in the low nanomolar range. That just means that DMT would have to be present around this concentration to be able to activate those receptors. Um, and it's pretty widely accepted that the serotonin 2A receptor is the one that's responsible for generating the hallucinogenic and psychedelic effects of, of DMT and other psychedelics. More recently studied and more recently discovered is the trace amine associated receptors and less is known about those, um, but it does know that DMT binds with and interacts with them at a, at a low uh, micromolar affinity. This is much higher than what we see with the serotonin receptors, but it's still maybe physiologically relevant. And it's known that these receptors are responsible for regulating uh, various aspects of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin neurotransmission. Um, and then finally, the sigma-1 receptors. These are widely expressed throughout the body, and uh, they've been studied a little bit more extensively than the, than the trace amine receptors. And they're responsible for uh, stress signaling, um, protection from hypoxia or lack of oxygen, and immune responses. Uh, the only criticism about the role of DMT and sigma-1 receptors is that there's a really high uh, affinity for, uh, or a really low affinity for the sigma-1 receptors. So DMT has to be present in the body at a concentration of around 14 micromolar to activate these receptors. And that's, uh, that's a pretty high concentration and probably difficult to achieve and wouldn't happen without some sort of concentration mechanism in place. Um, so there's a little bit of criticism with that, but regardless, um, not much is known about, about whether or not DMT um, has downstream, causes downstream ac activation of any of these receptors or, or what the effects are. Um, but we also know that DMT may have a role in immune or inflammation response. It may protect against hypoxia or it may promote neuroplasticity. And I'll just focus on the hypoxia point here for now because I think it's really interesting. This work was done by uh, Dr. Ed Fresca, who's in Hungary and it was done a few years ago. And what they did here was they uh, cultured um, basically human neurons, human brain cells in a dish, and they exposed them to um, hypoxia or they exposed them to low oxygen conditions. And then they added DMT and then measured the amount of cell survival. So what we see here in the black line on top is um, normox. This is just normal conditions. So after six hours, basically 100% of the cells survive. <clears throat> and what we see here in the yellow and brown lines is hypoxia. So um, after six hours in low oxygen conditions, <clears throat> only about 20% of the cells survive. But if you take that same condition, that hypoxic condition, and you add uh, either 50 or 200 micromolars of DMT to the cells, then you get a nearly threefold increase in cell survival. So this just suggests that um, giving DMT to cells has a, a, a hypoxic protective effect. So um, the connection here and their reason for doing the study, I believe, is to basically test the hypothesis that DMT is somehow involved in the near-death experience. <clears throat> in the near-death experience, you would expect to have uh, reduced oxygen. It, it could be a hypoxic condition, and perhaps DMT is secreted into, the, into some uh, region of the body to protect the cells and protect them from the, from the low oxygen conditions. Really interesting study, and uh, they have also shown that these effects are, are actually uh, modulated through the sigma-1 receptor. And whether or not endogenous DMT can get at levels to activate that receptor is, is really not known, um, but it is an interesting finding nonetheless. And finally, we know that uh, DMT synthesis might and likely does occur in neurons, uh, in neurons of the brain. And this work is done by my uh, good friend and colleague, John Dean here, who is gonna be defending his thesis in a couple weeks. So we'll give, uh, give him some good vibes. And what, uh, what, what's shown here is, um, staining of brain tissue, of, uh, of, of rat brain tissue. And if we remember the biosynthetic pathway of DMT over here, we have tryptophan, gets, met, gets uh, decarboxylated and then methylated to make DMT. And the two enzymes necessary are AADC and INMT. And uh, here we have INMT in blue, AADC in red, 
And we see that in regions of the visual cortex, hippocampus, cells of the pineal gland and the choroid plexus, we see co-localization of those two enzymes. Um, and that's seen in each of, the, each of the regions here. And if we see co-localization of those two enzymes, it provides strong evidence <clears throat> that there may be DMT synthesis occurring in those cells. And we've gone on to um, show that this co-localization actually occurs in other brain regions as well, including the amygdala, cerebellum, hypothalamus, and uh, other regions of the visual cortex. So this just suggests that DMT is likely being synthesized in, in neurons of the brain, of the rat brain at least. Um, so this brings up the fundamental, fundamental unanswered questions. So why does the mammalian body produce a compound that induces these vivid, powerful hallucinations, disembodiment, and profound psychedelic effects? So what is the role of endogenous DMT and how is it regulated? Is it actually the spirit molecule? And what does it even mean to be a spirit molecule? <laughs> um, so uh, the answering of those questions is basically the uh, motivation of my PhD thesis. And I'll talk a little bit about our approach to how we're studying endogenous DMT and then be able to give you some uh, preliminary data as well. So uh, we have a couple of different aims that we're focusing on at the moment. And the first aim is to uh, determine if DMT actually exists as a functional neurotransmitter in the mammalian brain. And uh, to do that, we can look at the concentration and the levels of some other canonical monoamine neurotransmitters. So this table is just a compilation of studies in rats, looking at the, the levels of neurotransmitters that are, that are detected in these, in these animals. And we look at um, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. We see that the range of uh, concentrations is ranges from about 0.1 up to about five nanomolar. And when we look at uh, the work from uh, John Dean and others in the Borjigan lab last year, um, they were able to show that the DMT concentration falls well within the ranges of other known canonical monoamine transmitters. And um, that basically supports the hypothesis that DMT may exist as a functional neurotransmitter in the brain. Um, and in order to call something a neurotransmitter, it's important to define our criteria for what neurotransmitters are. So here's a list of things that are uh, necessary uh, to be able to call something a neurotransmitter. So let's look at a, a serotonin a schematic of a serotonergic neuron to better understand what, what a neurotransmitter is. So with serotonin, it also starts from tryptophan and tryptophan enters the cell and these two enzymes, TPH and AADC, um, change tryptophan to produce serotonin. So these two enzymes uh, make it such that this cell is a specialized neuron for serotonin synthesis. Once the serotonin is produced, it gets packaged into these vesicles that protect serotonin from monoamine oxidase. And it also concentrates them for, uh, to produce, a, to produce an exocyto exocytotic event. So there's a vesicular storage mechanism for this, for this serotonergic cell. Um, and then once, uh, once an activity, once a signal comes into the cell, it initiates an exocytotic event where serotonin is released into the uh, synaptic cleft and it initiates downstream events. So there's an activity dependent release into the extracellular space. And then finally, that serotonin is recycled through a, a transporter called serotonin transporter or CERT and it's taken back up into the cell where it can be um, recycled or reused in other ways. So there's plasma membrane transporters for reuptake. So that brings up the question, does DMT then qualify as a neurotransmitter? Well, we've seen before that it looks like uh, there are specialized neurons for synthesis, for, for DMT synthesis. So we have cells in the visual cortex, hippocampus, pineal gland, and choroid plexus that appear to have the necessary machinery to synthesize DMT. Uh, we also see that there appears to be an activity dependent release into the extracellular space of DMT. Now, I'll, uh, granted, this is a really crude way to measure um, activity dependent release because what we're looking at is baseline levels of DMT and then DMT following experimentally induced cardiac arrest. Um, but we do see an increase nonetheless. So it suggests that some physiological activity, even though it's pathophysiological, um, initiates the uh, release of DMT into the extracellular space. So the only two things we don't know are, is there a vesicular storage mechanism for DMT? And is there a plasma membrane transporter for, for reuptake? So these are the things we're actively working on. And uh, we're doing a variety of experiments to, to answer those questions. So our ongoing studies in, include pharmacological transport assays to seek out potential transporters for endogenous DMT storage and reuptake. Uh, we're also continuing our molecular techniques to probe for DMT specific transporters in the rat and human brain. 
uh, and we're also utilizing uh, additional transgenic mutant rat models to probe for in vivo mechanisms of DMT uptake and transport. Um, and moving on here to AIM-2. So this is the AIM that we've had a little bit more uh, progress on lately, and I'll give a little more information about it. Uh, and what that aim is, is to search for functional roles of endogenous DMT in mammals. So why is DMT in the body and what is it doing? <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, um, the role of endogenous DMT remains mysterious. Even though we've known about it for several decades, we don't know what it does. A lot of people have hypothesized that DMT is involved in some aspect of dreaming, just because of the fact that when you give DMT, it's very hallucinatory. Uh, it's, uh, it's got disembodiment effects, just like when you're dreaming. Uh, other people have like we mentioned before, propose that it may be involved in the near-death experience or some aspect of dying. Uh, others too have suggested that maybe certain states like flow states or moments of insight or creativity and imagination may be associated with some DMT regulation in the body. Or uh, as Dr. Strassman coined, the spirit molecule, maybe DMT is, is related to spiritual experiences. And finally, there's uh, still some speculation that DMT may be related in um, certain uh, developments or continuation of, of psychiatric disease or, or other psych psychotic disorders. But with all these hypotheses, there's very little uh, evidence to support or refute any of them. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done to, to determine what DMT's role actually is. And in order to study the role of DMT, we're using um, um, uh, an INMT deficient rat model to do that. So we'll go back to that biosynthetic pathway of DMT again, and we remember that AADC and INMT are the enzymes necessary for DMT synthesis. What we've done is use CRISPR-Cas9 technology to delete or mutate the INMT gene, uh, therefore deleting it and making it non-functional. And that effectively um, deletes or prevents the production of DMT in the body. So this allows us to take uh, an animal, a wild type animal that normally produces DMT and compare that to a mutant animal that no longer has the ability to produce DMT. And in order to, um, to analyze these animals and to phenotype them, what we're doing is we're comparing, like I said, wild type versus INMT knockout animals. So these will be the DMT deficient animals here. And we're doing a, a variety of different types of analyses. The first thing we've done is quantitative sleep scoring. So we wanted to ask the question, does the deletion of INMT and or DMT have a role in the regulation of sleep? Um, we're also doing in vivo microdialysis. And this is a method where we actually insert a probe into the brain of an animal and we collect dialysates or collect samples from the extracellular space of the brain. And we're able to directly measure and quantify DMT, uh, other neurotransmitters, metabolites, and a number of different amino acids. And then uh, finally, we're doing uh, quantitative electroencephalography. So this is basically uh, measuring the brain waves of, of the animals and comparing the cortical dynamics to seek out different phenotypes between the wild type and the knockout animals. And uh, the first two uh, aspects here are a little bit preliminary, so I, don't, I can't provide any data on that, but I'll talk a little bit about um, our EEG data and what we found over the last, last few months with that. So the EEG recording setup for our animals, what we do is we uh, implant them with a, a chronic implant of three different electrodes, one in each of the frontal, parietal, and occipital regions of the skull and also a reference electrode up near the sinus. Then with this implant, we can then mount a, a tether to the animal's head and they're able to rel behave relatively freely within their cage. And we can monitor the EEG spectra over um, uh, a long period of time while the animals are, are behaving in their, in their home cage. And today I'm just gonna talk about um, measuring power. So we've also looked at um, coherence and another measure called lempels of complexity, but today I'll just talk about power and the methods for doing this. I can um, go through this quickly. Um, we basically look at uh, different sleep stages. We're looking at wake, non-REM, and REM. And what we do is we select certain epochs of 100 seconds each, and then we do a, a fast Fourier transform. And that's how you calculate the absolute power of, uh, of an EEG signal. And power is basically a measure of the intensity of the signal at a certain frequency band. Um, once we've done that, we can average all of those epochs into a single 100 second epoch, and then we can decompose all of those, uh, those, those averaged epochs into individual frequency bands. And we can come up with a single value for delta power, theta power, all the way up to, to gamma power. And these different frequency bands are just 
um, measures of the, the frequency of oscillations of, of brain waves. And then we repeat this analysis for each electrode, frontal, parietal, and occipital, and then for each um, vigilant state for waking, non-REM sleep, and REM sleep. And <clears throat> here, here are some of the results. So this is a kind of a busy slide and there's a lot going on, but I can um, break it down a little bit here. So we have six panels here and each panel is a different frequency band. So this is our Delta frequency. Uh, over here we have theta, alpha, beta, low gamma, and high gamma. And uh, each panel is broken up into three columns. So in red, we have wake. In green, we have non-REM sleep. And in blue, we have REM sleep. And then we're looking at wild type in red here and then knockout in blue. <clears throat> And what we see pretty much across the board is a pretty significant decrease in absolute power in the knockout animals. And this is uh, consistent in um, waking periods at almost all frequency bands. Uh, it's less prominent in non-REM stages. We don't see it too much in non-REM stages. Um, there's uh, stars at the bottom of each of these to denote the significance too, by the way. Uh, and we also see decreases in, uh, in REM sleep in, in a number of different frequency bands. So this is a, a pretty interesting finding and um, it's unexpected to see such a, such a widespread and broadband decrease in EEG power in the knockout animals. And just to sort of condense this, uh, these data down into, like a, into a smaller form, uh, we can look at just the p-values of all of the comparisons. So on the y-axis, we have the p-values of each comparison. And then this is looking at electrode location. So where do we find the most significance? So looking in the frontal areas, we find uh, the most p-values that are below 0.05 uh, relative to the parietal and occipital areas. And then looking at vigilance state, we see active wake. So in the waking period is when we see the most, uh, the most number of p-values below the level of significance. And that just suggests that um, the effects of INMT deletion seem to be strongest in the frontal brain regions and also during the waking period. So uh, whatever, D, whatever INMT is doing to produce DMT or whatever, whatever other function it has, uh, it's having a, the strongest effect based on these analyses in frontal regions and during the waking state. So how do we interpret this? Um, yeah, it's, uh, so here's just um, another representation of the data. So this is just uh, a visual look at the at the, the graph that we just looked at and this is looking at the spectrograms during waking and we see high gamma low gamma all the way down to delta wild type on the left here and knockout on the right we see a pretty uh, clearly visible and significant decrease in in the power uh, between between these two these two genotypes and in the center here we can see the regions with significant differences so frontal parietal occipital so a lot of differences there um, looking at non-REM, there's less of a difference. It seems like the effect seems to be more during waking. And then looking at, at REM sleep, we also see some differences, mostly in frontal regions, mostly at the lower lower frequency bands. So very interesting. And how do we interpret these results? It's um, it's difficult to find a model of, of, of widespread reductions in EEG power. Um, but after a little bit of searching, uh, it came up that um, this is actually what happens during the psychedelic state. So a lot of people have been working on um, fMRI studies and EEG and um, MEG studies to, to measure the brain during the psychedelic state. And what they also see is a relatively broadband and widespread reduction in EEG power um, during the psychedelic state. So this is um, psilocybin here. And the purple regions are indicating significant uh, reductions in power following psilocybin or following magic, the compound in magic mushrooms. We also see over here, this is a similar study looking at LSD, psilocybin, and ketamine. Um, and then a control on the right on the right column here, and we see similar things: broadband and widespread reduction in EEG power after the administration of, of psychedelic substances. So this is a little bit paradoxical. You would think that if you delete INMT, uh, then DMT is gone, so the psychedelic substance is gone. Um, why would you see the decrease in, in power? Um, that's what we're investigating, and that's our that's our next uh, focus. But what these researchers state in their in their paper is that that the decreases here occurred in all of the frequency bands implies a general collapse of the normal rhythmic structure of cortical activity. So this just suggests that INMT and or DMT uh, play an important role in the modulation of cortical activity. Um, so moving on to the CO2 induced cardiac arrest experiments. So why do we wanna do this? So, so what we're doing here is inducing cardiac arrest in animals and we're measuring 
their EEG during cardiac arrest. So why are we interested in this? Well, we've talked about before um, DMT models the near-death experience. There's a, there's a hypothesis that um, during the dying phase or during near-death experiences, maybe DMT is related somehow. And we've also seen from the work of uh, John Dean and others in the Borjigan lab that following cardiac arrest, there's a surge, a significant increase in, in DMT in the brain. So maybe it has something to do with a, with a dying experience. Uh, and also looking at some older research from the Borjigan lab, it's shown that uh, there's actually a surge of electrical activity in the brain following, following clinical death. So now that we have uh, the use of this INMT knockout animal, now that we have the use of this animal that theoretically does not produce DMT, we wanna measure the brain activity in that animal uh, during the dying period and find out if we see similar, similar effects compared to wild type. So um, looking at the uh, experimental setup, this is just a spectrogram, an example spectrogram of what it looks like during the CO2 experiments. So this is a 10 minute period on the x-axis here. And at two minutes, we start infusing uh, CO2 vapor into the animal's chamber. And within about, uh, within about two minutes following that, the animal stops breathing. And um, we see a, a, a very typical sort of theta surge and a few other uh, typical landmarks of, of uh, asphyxiation. And then about five minutes into the experience, uh, into, the, into the dying experiment, we see a pretty large surge of coherence in, from the uh, alpha up to the gamma range. And what we're gonna do with this is just, I'll talk about absolute power today. We're gonna compare the absolute power between wild type and knockouts. And um, we can look at the data here. So this is similar to the, to the graph I showed before. We have all of the frequency bands and we have time on the x-axis. So looking at delta, theta, alpha, all the way up to um, really high gamma, We're looking at power uh, during the infusion of CO2. So here is uh, the start of CO2. And then the red line here in each of the panels is uh, approximately when the animal stopped breathing and when we would suppose them to be clinically dead. So um, what we see is consistent with the other results. We see wild type in red, knockout in blue. Um, knockout has a, a pretty, significant reduction in power across all frequency bands in each in each condition outside of outside of this one um, but what we also see which is interesting i think is the uh, attenuation of this spike that occurs right when co2 starts so in delta theta alpha all the way up you see a spike right at the onset of co2 infusion but with the knockout animals you see that's that's suppressed at least in delta beta and the low gamma so whatever the whatever that spike is indicating, it's it's not happening in the knockout animals. Um, so these are sort of the foundational studies for us to move forward to to get a more clear picture of what INMT is and DMT are actually doing in the brain. And just to summarize here, um, relative to wild type animals, the INMT knockout animals show widespread broadband reductions in EEG power across the cortex, and these effects are most pronounced in frontal cortex regions and during the awake state. And these findings are consistent during CO2-induced cardiac arrest exper experiments, and the delta, beta, and gamma spikes are absent in the knockout. So uh, just to summarize the whole thing, these results suggest that INMT functions as some sort of a modulator of cortical activity. And what it's doing yet, we're not sure, but we're beginning to uncover that with, with some of these experiments. And just to wrap up here, I'd like to thank everybody who uh, supported me and was able to help out with all of these, all of these studies. All of my committee members, Gmo, Michael, Brendan, Christian, and Carol, all the lab members and collaborators that helped make this possible. Uh, my best friend and partner, Taryn Schiff, and all the other colleagues and friends who have helped me out. Um, and thank you all for your attention. If anybody has any questions, feel free to email me, email me here, or contact me anytime. Um, and I'll just leave it with, uh, with this slide here. You know, it can be a topic of discussion here. Is DMT the spirit molecule? Um, Dennis McKenna says that nature is drenched in DMT. Is this simply an accident of biochemistry or is it an indication of something more profound, an inherent intelligence that is built into nature? I'll leave that, leave that question and, and I can take any questions if anybody has any. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. And hopefully we will start getting some questions in the chat room. Okay. 
Oh my God. I knew somebody was going to ask that. Do we have quite oh, a <laughs> have you ever used DMT? <laughs> I had a dream about it once. Huh? I had a dream about it once. You had a dream about using it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Interesting answer as well. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Aaron, we'll start with you. Could you go ahead and ask your question, Aaron? Yeah. Um, so this one is, it's not related per se to your, uh, talk, but well, um, so some of us are prospective graduate school students, uh, looking at graduate school. What is it, what is graduate school like at, at U of M? Uh, what led you there? What might be some advice you have for uh, prospective students uh, at gra into graduate studies? Yeah, uh, it, I'm, it really depends on what kind of field you want to go into. But what I can say about U of M is that it's it's huge, and there's there's so many people that are there to support you. And um, if you saw on that last slide the list of collaborators, that's really just a fraction of the people that I've worked with and that have helped me throughout this project. So whether or not you need an expert in chemistry or genetics or some sort of analytical tool, it's, it's probably accessible at U of M. So it's a great place to go if you wanna really get involved in research. Um, <clears throat> how did I get involved with U of M? Well, I wanted to do psychedelic research. I contacted Dr. Strassman. I said, who's doing research on DMT? And he connected me to this lab here, Dr. Borjigan's lab here, here at Michigan. Um, so I would say uh, if you wanna stay local, then you know Michigan could be a great place to go. And, it probably depends on what your area of study is, but look for look for an advisor and a program and a department that really suits your interests. Make sure that you're going to find something that is going to keep you excited and um, make you make you want to want to do the work. Um, let's see, Emma. Emma, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Okay. Um, I was going to ask if any research has been done about the possible connection between patients with epilepsy who kind of receive this aura with deja vu-like impaired symptoms, kind of similar to a stroke, and maybe if that's correlated to the release of epilepsy. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I don't know of any, of any research that's been done related to that. Um, there's a lot of speculation in regards to um, different different types of breathing exercises or different types of um, you know physiological extreme you know whether that's a, a reduction or an increase in, in, in breathing respiration rate that that have been hypothesized to be associated with with DMT release or DMT production um, but as far as any any research or trials I don't know of any that have, that have actually looked into those those questions uh, let's see Doyon as a question, D-O-Y-U-N, if I'm pronouncing Hi. It. Okay. Um, so I have a question for like, can DMT be used for a medical purpose? There's, there's a group that uh, believes, believes so, yeah. Uh, if you remember the slide I showed about hypoxia protection, uh, where DMT is shown to protect cells from low oxygen conditions. I saw, I saw a talk from that researcher that I showed on there, Ed Fresca, and he says, my dream is to have a vial of DMT in every ambulance, every operating room, every emergency room, because he thinks it's this uh, super protective molecule uh, to, to bring back people from uh, cardiac arrest or other, other you know, critical low oxygen conditions. So there is a possibility that DMT may have a medical implication but um, obviously, yeah, no studies have been done on that. And it would have to have to start in animals, I'm sure, before anything went forward. And there's a lot of work that would need to be done before it would ever get into any sort of, sort of clinical trial. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Anaya, Anaya. Um, hi, uh, my question is concerning 
are there any other like neurotransmitters that we have more information on as to like what specifically they do in the brain that have similar effects as DMT? Like you mentioned that you notice when um, DMT was not produced that there was a low power in the frontal lobe. Are there any other neurotransmitters with those similar effects? Right. So when you look at other neurotransmitters like um, the main ones are going to be serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. And those have really important and widespread functions in the body. If you, if you delete any of those neurotransmitters or if you prevent the synthesis of those, there's going to be um, really drastic outcomes for the individual or the, or the experimental animal. Um, other studies have, sh- have looked at modulating the regulation of different neurotransmitters like serotonin or dopamine. And you also see EEG phenotypes. You'll see, you know, uh, increases or decreases in EEG power. Um, so those studies are definitely useful for uh, helping us determine what our next experiment will be, and for interpreting the results that we see in in the work here. Okay. There's a question from John. John Chavez. John. You could go ahead and ask a question, John. You're still on here. Sorry about that. Um, right. Yeah, I was just at, my my question was about uh, what do you make of the recent EEG study in a naturalistic setting in which exogenous DMT increased delta and gamma while suppressing alpha? Like, how do you what do you make of that in relation to the data that you just presented? Right. I think, I think what they saw was uh, pretty similar to what uh, Timmerman showed from the Imperial group, um, as opposed to, I don't know if Timmerman saw quite an increase in gamma as um, what in, as in the study you're talking about. But um, as far as an interpretation, I don't even know if uh, the Imperial group has been able to really pin down why the suppression in alpha may be related to the, the disembodied experience of exogenous DMT. And um, I know that alpha is uh, associated with a, a really sort of calm, eyes closed, maybe transition to sleep period. Um, and it's sort of paradoxical to see that with, with, with DMT because eyes are closed normally during a DMT experience. And um, my, my interpretation of it is, um, is naive. So I, don't, I, I, can't, I can't really say at this point. Okay. Uh, Dara has a pretty interesting question too. Dara? Um, So my question was, since DMT can also be found in plants, um, do you know anything about its function in plants? Like, is it somehow related to how it functions in animals too? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, And no, uh, I I don't know about the function of DMT. I think even the biosynthetic pathway of DMT in plants is not not completely worked out. So, you know, INMT is the enzyme necessary in in mammals to produce DMT, but I'm not even sure if INMT is in plants or if that's that's the way that it's synthesized. And when you study um, plant chemical, uh, chemical biology, you usually find that chemicals are produced to either deter an herbivore from eating the plant or maybe to, uh, to attract a pollinator or <clears throat> some other function of basically evolutionary survival. And people asked the question about psilocybin previously. They said, why do mushrooms contain this psychedelic drug called psilocybin? And I think it was found that it's actually a mechanism to prevent herbivory. So um, perhaps having psilocybin in a mushroom causes uh, an animal to have a really <laughs> challenging hallucinogenic <laughs> experience and it will prevent the animal from eating that mushroom in the future. Um, but you know psilocybin is really selective to a small group of a smaller group of, of mushrooms. but DMT is expected or hypothesized to to be present in hundreds or if not thousands of species of plants. Um, and one of the interesting things is uh, the metabolite of DMT when it's metabolized is um, indole acetic acid or auxin as it's called. If, uh, if any of you have studied uh, auxin or, or that compound, you know that it's, it's, a, it's a widespread plant hormone that does basically everything in plants. It's responsible for, for growth, development, 
um, for, for almost every process of, of plant biology, auxin is, in, is involved. And that's the primary metabolite of DMT. So whether or not DMT has a, has a role in that, um, it's hard to say. It could just be a byproduct. Um, but that's a really interesting question. Yep, yep. Uh, Nels and ELS. Nels, you got a question? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, does DMT have any lasting antidepressive properties considering it binds to serotonin receptors? Yeah, so there has been uh, one study, I believe, um, well, one recent study that was done in animals, done in, uh, I believe it was mice, and they used animal behavioral experimental models. I think they used the force swim test and some other uh, behavioral model. And they showed that DMT actually does have uh, antidepressive and anti-anxiety effects in the animal model. Um, I don't think that any of this has been studied in humans. And um, I don't, I don't know if there's even been, you know, some of these, some of these studies, there's are, there are survey studies that are put out sometimes to ask people who have already used DMT if they had um, beneficial effects from using the DMT. I don't think even, even any of that is out at, at this point. Um, so there's a, there's a possibility that it does, yeah, because of the, the serotonin activation, but I'm not too sure about it other than the animal studies. Um, I'm wondering, so one of the effects, one of the areas that people have thought the DMT affects is spiritual experiences. Are there researchers out there now looking at how to run those types of experiments to see if um, you, you know, the typical spiritual experience, maybe like during prayer or um, the singing of different spiritual songs or whatever we typically look at as a spiritual experience and connect that to maybe the levels of DMT. Do you know if? Yeah, that, that would be the dream study. If we could measure DMT during these types of experiences. Exactly, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, it, to, to do it in humans as well, that would be, that would be really, really neat. Right. Um, but, but I can say that people have, have addressed that question and they have studied it and they've done it more so um, with the context of, of correlation. So looking at maybe long time meditators or maybe shamanic practitioners mm -hmm. or uh, people that undergo other types of spiritual experiences, like you mentioned, you can put EEG on those people while they're doing that, while they're, while they're meditating and you see actually similar effects as what you would see during the psychedelic experience. And maybe not specifically DMT, um, but definitely with, uh, with psilocybin and LSD, um, you see mainly um, what they see is a, it's a, reduce in, in the a reduction in the default mode network. So the default mode network is this brain network that's basically responsible for the generation of the ego, generation of like, I am here, I'm doing this, I'm planning this, I'm, I've done that. So mental time travel, all of that is related to the default mode network. When you take psychedelics, the default mode network is suppressed. Uh, and what they see is during with, uh, you know, experienced meditators and other types of uh, spiritual experiences, the default mode network is always suppressed, it's, it's also suppressed. So there is a connection there. Um, but as far as, um, yeah, as far as a direct connection to DMT, I can't, I can't really say. Yeah, we co I can't remember the correlation, but I remember reading sometime where people, when they were praying, some sort of biochemical process was increased. I can't remember it right now, but, uh, and, and how those studies were actually done. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that would be a very interesting um, set of studies. Uh, Daniel? Daniel, you have a question. Uh, yes. Um, so earlier you stated uh, you stated that I hope you can hear me. Uh, earlier you stated that the DMT could produ provide hypoxic hypoxia production, and I was just curious, like, if you ever looked into cancer cells, have a poss possibility of utilizing uh, DMT as a way to protect itself because well, cancer cells really do anything to protect itself. I was wondering if there's like any signaling ways that they can do and try to help its own survival. Yeah, that, that would be a really interesting, interesting thing to look at. And um, that group who was, was doing that work is um, they've been, they've been pretty active lately. They've had a few other publications come out recently and 
Um, I don't think they've looked at that yet, but that would be, uh, yeah, an interesting future direction for them. I agree. So we, I'll say it, at least two more questions. Jem, uh, Jem Yarl, you have a question that you just posed. Uh, yeah, I was, I, um, I've been doing some Alzheimer's research and I came across a paper that's uh, where the researchers were exploring uh, tryptamine and how it inhibits the amino isolation of tryptophan to the tRNA molecule and that reduces the overall um, bioavailability for protein biosynthesis. I just wanted to know if you know anything about that. Man, if you could send me that, that'd be great. I haven't, I haven't heard of that. It sounds interesting. Um, I don't sure. know anything about um, so it's, you're saying that tryptamine is able to um, inhibit the um, activity? It, it inhibits uh, T, the tryptophan binding to the tRNA, and that um, prevents it from like being integrated into um, peptide sequences during uh, from the in the ribosomes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. I'm, I'm not familiar with that, but um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to love to see that if if you could share it. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Okay, um, Hannah, then Isabel will close us out. Hannah, you could go first. Hi, so um, I had a question in, um, do you think that the varying levels of DMT in the brain could play a role in mental illnesses like schizophrenia or like even a bipolar disorder? Yeah, it's really not that far-fetched to hypothesize that. <clears throat> um, and that's really based on the correlation between the subjective effects of exogenous DMT and the potential that, that DMT and, and, the, and the schizophrenic or psychotic effects that you're, that you're describing. Um, whether or not DMT plays a similar role endogenously is, is really not known. People are sort of um, hedging their bets on the, the fact that because DMT produces psychedelic effects when you administer it, then it must produce some sort of psychedelic effect in the body, but that's really not not known. So it's a possibility, but it's really not known at all. Um, but um, there could be some, it's, it's really not that far-fetched to think that maybe, yeah, maybe some sort of regulation process within DMT synthesis, storage, reuptake, transport is altered, and that could, could play a role in the development of, of psychiatric disease. Um, but I'll also say that in regards to the idea of DMT as a spirit molecule and other things, it's really, I mean, physio brain physiology, neurophysiology is so complex to be able to isolate a single molecule and say that this molecule is causing schizophrenia or causing, you know, a near-death experience. I think that's a little bit um, uh, reductionist, and I think that it's more complex than that. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I would guess that yes, maybe DMT plays a role in those types of things, but I think it's only one of a one part of a much bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And finally, Isabella. Hi. Um, so I was just wondering, does increasing the dose of DMT increase the intensity or the length of time of its effects? Uh, it increases the intensity. I, I wouldn't say that it um, increases the length of time from the studies that I've looked at, um, but there's definitely a, a threshold dose. So with uh, studies by <clears throat> Rick Strassman, who wrote the Spirit Molecule book, um, he gave uh, 0.4 milligrams per kilogram and four milligrams per kilogram. And the low dose uh, had very uh, basically sub-perceptual effects. So the intensity is dependent on the dose, but the duration, uh, I, I, I don't believe that it's as, as dose dependent. Um, it, it may have some role, but, but because DMT is metabolized so rapidly, it really just um, sort of comes in and goes out. Okay. All right, thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, topic and seminar presentation. And Nick, we wish you all the best in your studies. Make some cool discoveries here. <laughs> and <Thanks> um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. And thank you team. I saw your professor on here as well a while ago. So thank you and your lab mates for helping us understand some more about this interesting molecule. Yeah, it was really a pleasure and thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. Okay. All right. <laughs>
a copy of the video. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Lots of great questions. I'm wondering if I can get the chat too. I'd like to see what some of the people were posting. Okay, yeah, we'll save, yeah, we'll save the chat with all the questions. And Jemuel just sent you a link to, I guess, that article about the question he asked. Oh, I see it, yeah. 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 Great, yeah, if you could share that, that would be great. Thanks a lot. All right, sounds good. Thanks again. All right, thank you guys. We'll see you later. See you later. Bye.